good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming again. So today is another day for lecture. So uh, we have the pleasure to uh, to have a uh, Professor Nick Gosh as a visitor to the Jackson School, and um, you know he's coming all the way from India, the Institute of Technology over there, to talk about carbonate clumped isotope. For more detailed introduction, I will let. Uh okay, thanks, Luke. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Prasenjit, who uh, is here for the semester, actually. So if you'd like to meet with him, uh, it doesn't have to be a rush. Uh, he'll be here uh, maybe through November, yeah. Uh, maybe even into December, we're, we're talking about that. Um, yeah, so he's, he's, he, but he's, uh, he's at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, which, as I understand it, is one of the few places in the world that actually gets hotter than Austin. Um, and, uh, and so... I hope you've enjoyed the summer here. Nice, cool summer. Um, uh, Prasenjit uh, completed a bachelor's degree at uh, Delhi University and then went on for a master's at uh, IIT uh, Roorkee and then a PhD at the Physical uh, Research Lab in Ahmedabad. Uh, and then he um, did a series of postdoctoral fellowships culminating with uh, three years in John Eiler's lab at uh, Caltech where he made the first ever clumped isotope measurements. And he's going to tell us a little bit about that uh, today. Uh, after Caltech, uh, he did a short stint at Tokyo Institute of Technology and then went on to Indian Institute of Science, where he moved up through the ranks and is now a full professor. And Prasenjit has, uh, has done a lot of traveling. He's been a research fellow in many different universities across the globe, in North America, Europe, and in Asia, so we're lucky to have him here for the semester, and um, fortunate to be able to hear about clumped isotopes from one of the world's experts on it. So uh, thanks, Prasenjit. Oh, the other thing I want to say is that um, Prasenjit is also just a really nice guy, uh, and, and he's, he's, he's fabulous to talk to, and he's a really great person to have on sabbatical here. I feel like I'm on sabbatical too, and I feel like I've sort of been hiding Whereas Prasenjit is, is just, yeah, he wants to talk to everybody. He's very energetic. Um, so take a chance to meet him um, if you can make time for it. And while you're putting that on, let's hear it. Okay, thanks, Dan, for introducing me. Of course, it's a great pleasure to be here at Austin and with all of you. I, I'm mostly with many of the students we all, with whom I already started having some talks, dialogues, and discussion. And it's really fun doing science with all of you here. And I hope that my presence here will be really something which will be beneficial for many of you. And we might have a long time to go in future. OK, so before I start, I, uh, I thought that I'll show the lab. Uh, of course, I do have a lot of instruments. So of course, when I moved to India, uh, one of the reasons I moved was that Indian Institute of Science, which Dan mentioned, is one of the premier place for doing science in India. And uh, they didn't have a Center for Earth Sciences then. So they created Center for Earth Sciences the year I joined and uh, start thinking of taking Earth science related problems or thinking of relating it to the society because uh, the institute is largely funded from government versus something from the private enterprise. So they have interest in terms of developing programs which helps in terms of uh, human growth, society, and et cetera. So we built this lab. Mostly contributions comes from many of the lab members. And we do have exhaustive collaborations with people abroad. And I will tell you why uh, that will come. And uh, what I decided today to give a talk is uh, narrating the entire journey uh, since I started my time working on plum and revealing certain things which may not be known to many of you. So first, before going that, uh, I think Luke told that Indian Institute of Technology, but uh, <laughs> actually it is Indian Institute of Science, and we call our center the Center for Earth Sciences. So those who may not be knowing, it is one of the premier institute uh, started much before British left India from the colonial power. So now this was the brainchild of these two individuals, 
who thought that uh, there should be a premier institute in the country to do high-end research in science and engineering. This is Jamsetji Naureji Tata, or we call Jamsetji Tata, and here is another person whom we have a lot of regards, uh, even in US too. So he is popularly known as Swami Vivekananda. Uh, he has this thing that how we can grow our society after maybe at some point of time, once we are independent, thought of a venture, and uh, he was a rich person in that sense, contributed fund, and the land was given by Mysore Maharaja, uh, about 1,000 acres of land to build this institute. This was the old building, which is going back 1910, and it is lush green campus now with nearly about 56 different department, including science and engineering, doing research and teaching and uh, producing many young people who are aspiring to do contribute towards uh, uh, global science. This is Center for Earth Sciences, which is hosted there as one of the in the, all of the building where we have many of my colleagues who works largely from different domains, uh, right from somebody who is working on uh, mantle convections as well as code mantle boundaries, myself working on mostly climate, we have petrologists, we have in individuals who is working like Ramananda Chakravarti, he works on TIMS and ICT multi collectors. Atri works on many things to do with gray satellite, how it can be useful in terms of understanding tectonics. Sambuddha has joined very recently. He worked with Harry Elderfeld to uh, design something boron and lithium isotope systematics at Cambridge and earlier at Florida. Pavan works on again on seismic and Ramba, who joined again recently, works on how the water can be analyzed using satellite measurement. The story which I am going to reveal starts from my days at Caltech and this is many of you are familiar with old buildings at uh, Northward building at Caltech where we started working on this systems which was really remaining at that point of time from Sam Stein's time to use it for my purpose to do extraction of samples started working on clumping or CO2 extracted from atmosphere and carbonates. This was the machine or MOSFET which was available for the first instrument being commissioned in the world for MAT253 for doing something called multi-substituted isotope lock. It was not called as clumped isotope then. I will tell you that the new formulation came because this multi-substituted isotope locks is a very big name, difficult to pronounce. And uh, in fact, uh, we were, we debated about it. And many people contributed to this and I must acknowledge them. It just was a person and I, like I work with many people, so I, part of the entire system to start working. So Jess was a person who worked with me, uh, giving most suitable piece of materials right from deep sea corals to something surface corals. And then Rick was in Los Angeles County Museums. He works on utolits and uh, uh, he, he was one of the pioneer in terms of giving a lot of materials uh, for initial paper which came out. John was of course my mentor. And we have, I had nice two colleagues, one working on theories, like Edwin Schwabel, who is in, at UCLA now, and Hagi Afei, who is right now at Hebrew University. So they were our partners, and anything which I am telling is partly the work which were done together. The seminar, I outlined it in the following way. First, I will talk about establishment of this uh, new technique, which you, somebody called it as molecular thermometry, or we will talk about some experimental level observations and the technological development. The calibrations which are made based on certain things synthesized from the lab and then taking it to the field and how it can be utilized, I will we'll, narrate that. And finally, I will tell that how myosin is something a best representative of the modern day and we should definitely know that in great sense and many of my students are working on myosin in the ocean turbulences. Before I start that, I must give a little flavor about where we originate from. So mineral based thermometry was first started by Sam F. Time way back in 1947 and many of you have read this paper and the technique was mostly useful in terms of getting temperature provided uh, you get this two parameter out from your sample of interest like carbonate and water. And uh, subsequent to this there were of course many work which was accomplished and they did lab precipitation of experiments like Kim and O'Neill did lab precipitation of calcium carbonate and showed that yes, it is possible to do the temperature reconstruction provided you have both these things managed very well. 
but unfortunately if you think of for of ask a geologist uh, he will definitely give you answer that water is not preserved so well in geological formation either you have to make an assumption or you have to get it indirectly from other measurements which are having no direct proof so there was always a gap and people used to fill up this gap with either elemental concentration measurements and i think tim is here to so just start using alkylone disk study or organics to talk about thermometry these are other two tools which are used i am not going to discuss about them but yeah so in uh, in maybe some occasions i will prefer to do that so as i mentioned the first paper which came out on this subject was mainly for co2 and it was not called as clumped isotopes it was mostly called as multi substituted isotope clumps and what is so this actually what is this new multi substituted isotope clump if you think of a co2 molecule these are the list of isotope clumps which you will get and uh, people have taken advantage of this three which are found largely in terms of abundance to get concentrations of 13c and 18o in the sample so 46 by 44 refers to something called 18o in the samples you have to do a minor correction which was called crake corrections and 45 by 44 gives you 13c from the co2 molecule if you analyze it there are a rest of the others which are though present but they are very small in quantity and so but one of them which is little bigger is 47 and the attempt at that point of time was that can we measure this with high precision and of course with modern day high stable resistance or um, uh, it is possible to amplify the signal to extend that you can do such kind of measurement with great confidence so that was the advantage taken when they started building this mat 253 and uh, now you call it mat to mat 53 ultra or plus but essentially start talking about this three radicals which have very lower isotopic anomalies to measure it high precision and that was the aim now in order to do the measurement you need to have a standard or reference frame this reference frame which was suggested at that point of time it has evolved i will narrate that but it suggested at that point of time is a co2 which is in the sample which can be your air it can be from the carbonate you analyze it with respect to something called scrambled co2 or randomized co2 you take the same sample back after analysis put it into a very coarse tube leave it for certain period of time finally you analyze that back and you refer that as something which is scrambled so when you try to relate this you get a parameter which is 47 and you see that how important this parameter is when you think of this experiment which was again been published in 2004 by Eiler and Swabel where they showed that it is possible to characterize CO2 generated from such kind of human made ignition sources like methane combustion car exhaust calcined CO2 compared with something like equilibrated water at different temperatures so this was a kind of a provocation for me when i joined caltech at in the year 2003 say that can i extend this and start doing something on carbon which can be another tool for doing that initial there were a lot of hiccups which always happens but finally we succeeded the idea is very simple that you have this molecule sitting there in carbonate which has rare isotope clumps now you need to take them out and we talk in terms of clumping something called homogeneous equilibrium here in this case i am talking about homogeneous equilibrium between carbonate radicals which has this rare isotope clumps inside and they are sensitive to temperatures based on the knowledge we know in terms of first principle analysis that you can actually calculate the energy difference between something which is rare and something very uh, abundant in a environment so now this energy difference is sensitive to temperature which is possible to calculate and you can relate this temperature based on certain observations which were being formulated based on the theory and swabel has provided this theory that at 0 degree and 25 degree and 300 degree it is possible to detect them with very high confidence so finally if you go to very higher temperature this slope definitely changes so higher temperatures have little salva slope compared to temperatures which we are seeing at that point of time finally you need to actually convert this carbonate into co2 and you adapt certain procedure one of the procedure which was available and very convenient to many of us and at the caltech was this line glass line where you try to use bacteriotide reaction vessel and try to synthesize co2 from the carbonate using phosphoric acid which is really 100% without any water and 
you just extract the CO2 cryogenically and analyze it and then you take the same CO2 back after an analysis and you call this as a scrambled CO2 and anchor it for with the equilibrated gas to refer to your 47 values. There are other methods too which I will tell you briefly there are other methods includes like drip method acid drip method which is conveniently being used in the community for doing isotope analysis and there is another method called common asset bath methods. So now this methods always rely on one important assumption is that you analyze a standard and sample in the same manner to be following the identical treatment allowing you to define your now sample with respect to standard. In any of these cases when you think of liberation of this CO2 from carbonate you actually lose one oxygen sitting there as a form of a water. So you need to have some fractionation factor and one has done very elaborately this fractionation factor and at that point of time I did that with very high confidence at Max Planck where we are thinking of generating a new standard called marble from Jena and we did a very elaborate calibration to see that how best precision we can establish in terms of its sensitivity to reaction temperature and we followed the same here to talk about plumbed isotope based fractionations which is very small compared to what is seen in case of oxygen isotope. So now other thing which comes in mind when you try to generate a kind of a calibration is that you need to now precipitate a carbonate from a medium and the precipitation always requires a water. So now I was, ta I was talking about a homogeneous process now here the heterogeneity come into picture because you need to dissolve a your lot of CO2 and carbonate into the solution and finally precipitate it by the process which can be degassing where you remove the CO2 excess from the solution finally precipitate it. So we successfully did that in the first experiment which was conducted in 2003 till 2005 precipitated number of those materials at constant temperatures and this was the first calibration which got published in 2006 and you might see this still being discussed in the literature. So now what, are the, what is this calibration all about? So now you can see here we, I have this red inverse triangle and normal triangles which is blue and you have another one which is like a square here filled square. They were, well, were the four first which were analyzed and in fact the first abstract which I published in the year 2004 at AGU carries those numbers and which uh, I told actually that this is a new tool for doing thermometry because I can distinguish something a deep sea coral from a coral which was sitting there at Sumatra. So these were gifts which came from Jess Atkins collections and Terry um, C who contributed Sumatran coral and I said that I can distinguish them very well with this new thermometer. So in, in this conference what really happened that Kutu said that no now it is the time for you to design this thermometry with precipitation experiment and in fact soon after 2004 AGU conference we started precipitating in multiple replicates this carbonates which at different temperatures and that's, that was essentially inorganic calcium carbonate precipitation line and we referred this with respect to something called heated gas and we designed this new thermometer of interest which is crystal lattice vibrational thermometry unlike what was really done earlier using what? people were thinking about heterogeneous met medium like water and O18. Now we have independent way of validating those temperatures which was established earlier. This was later on being tested for multiple things as I published something from fish utolids saying that how the thermometry is applicable and say that kinetic effect which is commonly seen for fish utolids carbonate precipitation is absent in terms of doing that using plumb. We analyzed many corals, brachiopods, mollusk and inorganic calibration. It was published by Euler uh, in EPSL 2007. The advantage of this was that along with this thermometry approach we had a very strong theory coming into picture and that was given by Swabel which comes from density function theory and where you have it is homogeneous equilibrium which has been predicted based on this theoretical calculation. So one can talk about the CO2, I can talk about the calcite and these are the experimental observations. So this gives a confidence that yes our theory and experiments are going hand in hand. Obviously we are losing, this is calcite, so this is 63 mass in the calcite structures which is being projected 
and we do acid fractionation to get the CO2 out. So, there is the acid fractionation effect which explains these observations and this is published in 2006 along with 2006 Gauche et al paper. So, now this has been revisited multiple times subsequent to that. Now, I will narrate you this 10 years what really happened. The first thing happened is the Danish and SRAC 2010 introduced a revised way of doing the calibration along with heated gas they called equilibrated CO2 as another reference frame. Common acid bath and drip acid method which is very popular in the community they started getting into place and secondary anchors start getting introduced which are mostly carbonates. There were multiple experimental observations testing it to ver verify the consistency of patterns and other things and this came out in 2013 I think by Henkes where it has been shown that yes uh, they call it as Ghosh scale and verified it with a new scale which was been proposed by Dennis and Strack. So, so there is obviously a difference ambiguity which has been created and I will tell you that we could able to resolve it based on the research which I have conducted across the world and I'll, how we did it we will now narrate it. So, always away from the original calibration. So, now 10 years have passed. So, this is the compilation which came out by Bonafesi, one of Euler's students and you can see that the screen is now populated with multiple materials of different kinds uh, which uh, gives you saying that things are getting much more different. So, so it is populated with multiple calibrations using uh, precipitate of diverse origin types which includes precipitation from active degassing, passive degassing. So, when you say uh, degassing is a method for precipitation of calcium carbonate. So, you can purge it with nitrogen, take out the CO2 from the system to precipitate carbonate. You can do that by putting certain chemicals like calcium chloride and precipitate it. So, both these methods were done and CO2 preparation method changed from original macri type reaction type to something like common acid bath and drip methods. That came into place. So, now 2018 this has been kind of a post mortem of what happened and what is shown here is that the calibration slopes varies from something steep. So, there were people with a different uh, ideology left who are following certain techniques of doing preparation, sample preparation or maybe precipitation, they were steeper in slope and you have community which has really something doing who were really even right in some sense. They were doing using drip methods and other methods to see that how they are shallower in slope. So, now what happens between shallowing and steeper slope is actually you get different temperature which is useful in terms of. Oh sorry. So, which gives you a different temperature when you think of doing this analysis. So, now coming back, we did some kind of analysis of what are these numbers took pain to get all the numbers which are raw numbers and this is something which is getting published in applied geochemistry where we showed that yes if you change from silt vessel method which is done at low temperatures to something like acid drip methods which are yellows here and if you go to common acid bath method you can actually very have a nice relationship which may be something very interesting because what is possible is that you can transform one platform to another platform if you have the numbers which are really available where you have heated gas being analyzed. So, this is one paper which is coming out and it, it gives the confidence that yes scale conversion is something possible. So, this is the offset which I was mentioning. So, there is a real offset between something which is done at say low temperature experiment and high temperature experiments. We do our experiment a little bit in a different way compared to the original macro type reaction type. We call it as a break cell method because we it is a little reinvention of the tool. We essentially isolate the samples from any kind of atmosphere for doing our sample preparation. This got published in 2019 and we created a lot of standards uh, along with rest of the other standards which are available from each each community. We created other standards which are of great attention. So, one of them which I was working on is something called OMC which is a kind of a carbonate formed at a temperature which is very low called Paul Hoffman's carbonate which is snowball carbonates 
and you have marj1 which is a metamorphic carbonates so they gave us a control and we analyzed it repeatedly using our 25 degree process and showed that yes we are very consistent and there is a consistent offset between both of them if we can measure them with high confidence then maybe we can give a more precise answer about the temperature things have evolved now so now along with conventional isotope ratio machine MOSFET you have laser based system for doing the analysis where you can use two different tunable lasers and to actually target this molecule of interest 6, 16, 13, 18, 17, 12, 8 so you can measure them with very high precision and the idea is was been published by a group from Arizona and from Kaohsiung Institute of Technology so we landed up into a collaboration with them and see that how does the performance of this our method works and uh, this is what I will give you a summary so this is a long time measurement of this two standards in my lab and this is done for last four months by one of my students staying there at Kaohsiung University Institute of Technology measuring them that we can measure them with same degree of confidence using two different tools for doing isotope measurements so essentially what we are trying to claim is that anchoring with this two reference material will give us very high confidence in terms of getting the temperature reconstruction. This individual Tamil who is one of the paleo oceanographer in my group, he has worked on first calibration of this again revisiting the old calibration using surface plankton and uh, reformulated this thermometry which gives again a slope which is very close to the original slope being proposed in my original publication giving confidence now that yes we can do the thermometry with higher degree of confidence. I will now switch track and uh, move into why myosin connects present and future and application of this new tool for doing thermometry. Why myosin? It is something after I was born in 1970 and now actually there is a 100 ppm rise in global CO2 and this is phenomenal. This is phenomenal based on uh, the Mona law observation is myosin a suitable example to correlate with the difference is that this is very small time and this is a very prolonged time but nonetheless earth has experienced this steady state conditions during certain period of time which was during with the high pco2 conditions so our investigation was mostly to see that how does ocean regulates in a high pco2 conditions and mostly the ocean which is confined with glaciers confined with large discharge from rivers the ocean which is really very dynamic and moreover there are myosin simulations which are available from climate, uh, climate models which gives a very different kind of predictions about hot conditions which is expected in the future. While I am talking about myosin, myosin is being discussed even in the literature because they talk about different scenarios. Now earlier they are called as RCP, now people call it SSP because of socio-economic impact of what happens if the, there is a large CO2 buildup. And uh, now myosin also serves as very important example going back in time. If you think of Indian Ocean, it is a very interesting ocean to look into because we have glaciers sitting there on the tops which gives part of the hydrological cycle and if you think of a rainfall which comes seasonally it brings lot of moisture from Indian Ocean dumping it into the entire land and that drives the entire economy and uh, we really get benefited out of the rain which happens seasonally and farmers really are dependent on that. Together with the land you have the ocean which is very productive, we have two oceans Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea which are productive regions of the world where you have large change in salinity which is mostly based on the uh, weathering which happens from the Himalayas. And if you think of Indian monsoon, these are the two atmospheric phenomena which helps in terms of explaining Indian monsoon variability. One is something which is in the textbook like Hadley cell where you think formation of large cloud masses which initiate from equatorial region and finally once you generate those high masses at around 30 degree latitude they descend and form a shell which moves things from low latitude to high latitude regions. So this is one way of circulation which helps in terms of moisture transport. 
there is another moist way of moisture transport which is called Walker circulation discovered by this famous experimentalist from ocean where you see that it modifies the cloud condensation process because it generates a huge amount of moisture due to unequal heating of tropical pacific. The heating happens because of wind which is a very important factor in driving this and uh, helping in terms of cloud build up and precipitation in the scheme. So now there are several other modes which are very popular uh, and uh, the mode which I am going to talk about is something called Indian Ocean Dipole which is little different from ENSO but it modulates the Indian rainfall pattern. What has been also proposed is that because of global warming there is expectation that the Walker circulations as well as Hadley cell they are going to get influenced and uh, we are going to see the reflection of that in terms of variability of Indian monsoon. So there will be a strong decrease which has been noticed from 1950 onwards and uh, modest intensification since 1998. So this has been a kind of a documentation. So it gives a good, uh, again a justification that why Miocene which is a high CO2 build up time we should see that how the circulations works. Moreover, the region is surrounded by highly upwelling zone which is dynamic productive zone and happens seasonally like one which I have shown here is the region which is southern part of India and then you have Somalia regions where which is highly productive zone and very important for in, ca in case of fisheries and other things. So let us see that how it performs. So now we had set of samples which originate from this IODP expeditions. 353 which ODP 758 was the sample being taken for our study and we performed plumbed isotope measurement on those and what was available was magnesium calcium based thermometry from another location which is sitting here. So we have we have adequate knowledge between this two and the CO2 concentration if you think at Mauna Loa and then the if you put this grid boxes between both of them. This is exercise done by again my student who the paper is under review. So now one can see that during this time frame between say 2021 and 1971 you can see there is a relationship or correlation which is weaker but nonetheless there is a relationship suggesting that you have a CO2 built up and there is a disparity between the temperatures between these two oceans surrounding the continent, continental landmass. And moreover, if you now go and try to see the simulations which are available from different climate models, it says totally opposite. Climate model prediction says that uh, with high CO2, you will have different kind of disparity between these two oceans. So, uh, and this is something which we need to test. And um, the idea is that can we use plumped and magnesium calcium? data which is available because uh, the reason I will tell you why magnesium calcium is something which we can say that it is reliable and we can use it for a time being to start assessment unless we also measure clump number from this. Because there were papers suggesting that yes magnesium calcium and clump they are working well for Holocene and LGM making life a little easier for us to convince that yes we can compare this and I will do that. So this is the record which has been generated and you can see that this encompasses the time right coming from mid Miocene climate optima where the CO2 concentration you can see very high. The CO2 concentration was really large and SST is about 2 degree cooler than the iso isotherm which is expected to generate IT ITCZ which is 28 degrees Celsius and this is for the region of Bay of Bengal. I am talking about the Bay of Bengal region. And if you try to use this temperature which has been there and use equilibrium concept of carbon and precipitation, you can talk about the water composition and that helps you to get a salinity difference of 3 PACU which is shown. This is complementary with something which is about the productivity, barium which has been analyzed from the same core suggests that M MMCO upwelling was prominent and there was high SMEC type to Keolinite by elite to chloride ratio suggests that fresh water flux from the continent. This was very evident. So now one, one can do this and try to test that how does the climate model fits with our observation and you can see the disparity. 
the Clyde modules is not revealing the same same information as we have seen and uh, we are seeing a proximus model is not very representative for mid Miocene climate optima for if you try to see the disparity between this two ocean surrounding Indian landmass. So, what we are seeing is analogous to positive Indian Ocean dipole which brings lot of cooling behavior to the Bay of Bengal region which is very prominent when Indian Ocean dipole become active. This is a scenario which comes out where you expect large upwelling which is coming from this region which is from Sumatra during the time of MMCO explaining majority of the observations which were earlier been documented by groups working on chemical weathering like Peter Klept and then there were people who were talking about upwelling index and others from the Indian Ocean perspective. We come next to another time which is mid Miocene climate transition which is above and you are saying there is a change in the CO2 concentration and there is now higher temperatures being recorded for the samples which have been analyzed from Bay of the Gulf and we can also get a SS sea surface salinity reconstruction based on assumption that you have equilibrium carbonate being formed and it correspond match with barium and other proxies. So, magnesium calcium thermometry which is being now projected from other regions also support part of the thing which we have got from the Bay of Bengal region suggesting that the temperature more or less for the Pacific matches with some with that in the Indian Ocean that means from Bay of Bengal during this time frame. Again we do the comparison with the model and here we can see that again there is model and observations are not matching with each other. It is analogous to something called negative Indian Ocean dipole which we have observed during transition time. And again this is validated saying that you have now instead of upwelling there is a downwelling at Sumatra region during transition time. And probably there was a lot of connections from the Pacific which drives the advection making the region warm rather than what was earlier been seen because of the connections which was there between say Mediterranean regions and this. Now coming to the last sections where you have post mid Miocene climate transitions which is the top you see that now both the oceans almost re represent the same kind of temperatures. Again the model and observations they are not exactly matching much this is much better than what it is and this suggests that establishment of the normal state of ocean and the modern South Asian summer monsoon which happened during this time interval between 13 to 9 million years and upwelling at Sumatra was the dominating process explaining these observations. So now, yes, probably this is the way forward as I always tell that uh, sometimes you get this funny question say, coming in the literature so that uh, now we are having a serious, serious crisis in terms of rainfall this year. So now it can Indian Ocean Dipole can save this, maybe what I feel is that uh, it is possible to answer this based on the past observation and that is what we should convince many of the funding agencies to tell that there is a need for contributing to this because finally if I, it is a societal benefit. I summarize my entire presentation right now and th I think that I am well on time for a lot of questions. So the thermometry for the mi mi mineral structures plays a very important for understanding the past climate. Clumped obviously give you an edge compared to other thermometry method and uh, uh, there is always more to learn from this with more experiments and ob experimental observations and I must tell this as I follow that we have now a system here in place where possibly maybe another one month down the line we will get numbers for doing plumb isotope measurement in the same campus uh, and which may be of some benefit to many of you. And now watch out for the next applications because the plumb really is something a new tool which requires more applications and I think that uh, that is the way forward. I leave this because these are the champions who worked in my lab uh, from diverse field right from geoscience to somebody from marine science and we call our lab as Oasis lab as uh, something which I tell that it is the only lab in Southeast Asia doing club measurements and uh, we have all set of instruments for doing certain measurements which are not available in other places.
thank you very much for your attention and i will be happy to take questions